All right, my friends, the problem with debt, man, I get this a lot, like debt, it can be good or it can be bad, and I, man, I just disagree. Um, yeah, we all need a debt to buy a house. Do we really, though? Do we really? <laughs> How else can you afford it? Well, maybe that's a sign of something. We all need debt to buy a car. Do we really? And I hear all the time, well, there's good bet, debt, bad bet, debt, Josh. I'm like, okay, what's a good debt? Well, it's a debt where you can take a mortgage interest deduction. I'm like, that's good. You know, the tax code is telling you what a good product or a bad product is. Okay, interesting. I don't agree in the least. And I guess bad debt would be consumer debt where you can't take the mortgage interest deduction. So if you can't take the mortgage interest deduction, is that what determines good and bad debt? So thus, if you can't take the mortgage interest deduction and your standard deduction, your mortgage is what? A bad debt? That doesn't make any sense. But Josh, you can lever. <laughs> I get this one a lot. You bought your house, you put 20% down, we'll just say $100,000 house. So your loan to value is 80%. 80% is the bank, 20% is you. Your house appreciates by uh, 20%. So now it's worth 120. All right, what happened to your equity? It went from 40,000 or 20,000 to 40,000. You've doubled your equity. You have a 100% return on that $20,000 uh, down payment that you made. Your loan to value is uh, 80%. So the bank still owes, you still owe the bank 80,000 bucks, but now you have $40,000 of equity. Does that make sense? That's the traditional way mortgage people will tell you. Say, look, man, 20% down, 80% loan to value, house goes up by 20%, You've just doubled your equity. And yet you only, you, you doubled it because all the equity is yours. And that's true. All right, man, that is true. That's how leverage works. When it works, it works well. You can make a lot of money leveraging yourself. When it doesn't work, it'll put you in the bankrupt mind. But here's even worse than that, not just going bankrupt or it doesn't work. What if you don't lose, what if you have a, a thing with income? You lose your job. You get a pay reduction. That sale you're hoping to close doesn't come through. What happens then? <laughs> I mean, was it that long ago where we saw people upside down? I bet there's still a bunch of people upside down. Their mortgages from 2008. So the theory behind the leverage is I say, okay, if that's so true, then why do you have any, any equity in your home whatsoever? Why wouldn't you won't borrow against the whole thing? 100% loan to value because the leverage concept. I mean, here I got no equity, literally none. I borrow 100,000, so I got 100,000 loan to value. Market goes up by 20%. I have $20,000 of equity with nothing at risk. I mean, why would anyone not do that if they truly believe in the leverage concept? Well, I don't have to be that extreme, Josh. And again, it goes back to why my problem with debt you still got that payment. And when you have a payment, you are not free. Because at the end of the day, regardless of what the equity does and how well you're playing the leverage market, until you turn that to cash, you still owe. You still have a monthly payment. You still have an obligation. Which inherently means two things. You cannot do what you wanna do because you still have to make that payment. And number two is, there's a good chance it's gonna work against you where it's a risk you took that didn't pan out and now you're paying the price for it. It's actually a third thing too, actually, with cheap credit. I got fly flying around me because I'm sweating like a pig. It allows you to live for today beyond what you should be doing. Actually, it's a good song, a band called Crumb Suckers from New York City. I used to love Crumb Suckers in 85. And they had a song called SH, you know what I'm talking about, Creek. You're up S Creek. And it, man, what a, I'll put the link in the show notes if you're into some fast moving, hardcore metal. The lyrics are just phenomenal. And this is what got me thinking about doing this video today. Because as I've been making my payments over time, that was long ago, the banker whines, basically calling his debt. I mean, I'll never forget, 2008, 
Just moved to Texas, two brand new little baby boys, not twins, Irish twins. And just for you who are not familiar with the Irish culture, that means they're born in the same calendar year. Not maternal twins, but Irish, same calendar year, which my two boys were. <sighs> had no income or had no equity. It got just got out by the skin of our teeth from taking a job with USA and relocating to Texas because we would have stayed in Virginia. It would have been bad. No other way around that. So we got lucky. All right, so what happens? We go down there. You know, all of a sudden you see, you can afford this, and you can afford that. And you get these big eyes, man. We're sitting in a three bed, one bath, what, 1100 square foot ranch that looked like a, a double wide for six years previous to that. Now all of a sudden I got these 3,300 square foot homes, three, five beds, three baths, tile throughout the kitchen, it's a huge kitchen. And that was all within my price range. Well, it wasn't my price range, because I had no money. It was the price range from the banker. The banker had was able to allow me to buy that home. And because I'm a veteran, I was able to put enough, what did I put, 2% down? I can't remember. You didn't have to put much down, just the closing cost of VA loan. And so now all of a sudden you're like, hey, my eyes bugged out how I could find that house. And it was awesome. And the minute we closed on that sucker, I got to get nervous. I wrote my book about this. So for you all have read my book, you'll know the story. The next uh, six months to a year, the market was just tanking. People being laid off everywhere. Price of real estate dropping through the, you know, dropping through the floor there. I had literally nothing to do at work. I was like, man, there is no way, no way they're going to keep me on. I mean, I literally am sitting there just twiddling my thumbs. And everything else was going hell in a handbasket. I said, why would they? And I had a decent, I was making more than I've ever made in my life at that point. I mean, I was, I was like, no way. And somehow they did. I don't know why. I guess they, uh, I, you know, I don't know. But somehow they did. They kept me on. They didn't hire anybody else. But they did keep me on. And uh, I was grateful for that. That year time, though, man, I was making the salary. I was able to afford it, quote, unquote, according to my salary, my debt to income. But they'll never forget, I also had $14,000 in credit card debt, and I had rolled it over to a 0% loan, because what I used to do, I used to borrow on the credit card and put it in my Roth IRA for both my wife and me. And so at this stage, you know, it seemed like a good move. And I still kind of think you should do that if you're just starting out to some degree, as long as you have, you don't start going crazy. So I'd, I'll never forget this, $14,000, had at USA, I got a, this is about 2006 or something like that. Had a 0% for the life loan offer from Citibank. Did a balance transfer. I'd play those balance transfer games all the time. And I got sick of it. And so finally I got this one from Citibank. Maybe it's 1.9% or something. I can't remember. But it's a tiny interest rate for the life of the loan. All I had to do is make monthly payments. And I was like, all right, sweet. I'm not having to pay interest on this that much. So I'll just go ahead and, and transfer it over. And just really try to knock that down. You know, the Dave Ramsey thing, snowball. Because I do believe in the snowball effect. I think it's great. And all of a sudden, out of nowhere, and uh, was it October 2008, I get a letter from uh, Citibank. And I, you know, you get all this stuff from the banks. You hardly ever open it. It said they're essentially calling their loan. Now, they weren't actually calling it. I didn't have a, an obligation to pay all back at then. But they're increasing the interest rate to 1499 I was like, what the hell? My credit score has always been impeccable. You know, I had nothing going on my credit score. You know what I'm saying? The only debt we had was a mortgage. And it was big, but my loan to val my uh, debt to income ratio is still 30% or less. That's nothing. That wouldn't be anything for them to violate their terms that we had. Well, what it was is just the, uh, they're pulling their, calling their loans. They said, we are in such a crisis now. We've got to have people look at the fine print so we can get paid, essentially. I didn't have 14,000 bucks. 14,000 bucks at 14.99% too. That's what, $3,000, uh, $2,600, $2,700 a year in interest. And I told you in my book, at the same point, one of my cars had broken down. I didn't have my, there's no AC in my Nissan. My wife had just broken down at a, a mall in South San Antonio. 
the middle of the summertime and we had to fix that car as an old 2000 Dodge Grand Caravan. And my car wasn't, the air conditioning wasn't working in that, in South, in, in South Texas in the middle of summer. I guess it was August, not October, because I remember it being hot and we needed all these things coming at once. So now my mortgage looked good, on paper looked good. No debt other than that 14,000 with Citibank. Got a mortgage, debt to income less than 30%. So I'm good to go, right? Well, hell no. Got four kids, one income, health insurance costs. You know what I mean? When you got children, you're blowing through your deductible on the health without question. Never mind your monthly premium. Never mind all the other stuff that comes when you're living in Texas, which is the cost of electricity. While low relative to kilowatt hours, you still run that air conditioning a lot. On top of that, I had $14,000 had to pay to Citibank. On, on top of that, I had uh, cars that needed to be replaced. And the AC on my car, I hired some guy to do it, 2,000 bucks, and he, it, it worked for about three weeks, and after that, it just went kaput again. I was like, dude, what? The? Anyway, all that was because of the debt I owed. That might not happen to you, but just put yourself in my position. What if it did? What's the likelihood you're going to maintain your sanity, your happiness, your feeling of comfort and joy when all this is going on? And this is financially. You know, my wife and I weren't at, uh, we weren't at loggerheads. I mean, we've had a good relationship. It's been perfect, but we've had, we still had a good relationship. It wasn't like we're, you know, I don't drink, thank God. But it wasn't like we're freaking yelling at each other. But Josh, that mortgage was a good debt. Huh. Now, what was the alternative? I, you know, the alternative would have been I could not have, to have bought a lower house, one with, where I could afford the more better with a cash flow. Because in this day and age, that's one of the reasons why education, housing are so flipping expensive because cheap money drives up the prices. I mean, that's just a fact. If you don't believe me, just wait to see what happens if interest rates go up. What happens to the price of homes? So when they go down. Well, they certainly don't appreciate because they're inherently more expensive from a cash flow perspective. So I'm not saying don't take on a mortgage to buy a home because that, there's no other way you're going to get the house. And I'm not saying, I mean, saying rent. Talked to a guy the other day on YouTube. I'm not talking to him. He posts on YouTube. He's paying nine fifty a month in rent or something like that, maybe a son, for a house that's 100000 bucks in Amarillo, Texas. So nine fifty a month times twelve, that's basically eleven thousand dollars. So he's paying eleven thousand bucks in mortgage or rent for a home that's worth a hundred thousand bucks. That's eleven percent capitalization rate for the, the owner of the home. <laughs> Rent's not cheap, man. It's not cheap. And the reason for that is because supply of housing is so small as we sit here today that Anytime there's a housing build, it's going to increase the prices for sure. There's just not enough housing for the, to meet the supply, to meet the demand. Which people say, oh, well, that tells you that if I leverage, heavily leverage, it could be a, a win for me. Because the housing will go up. Well, it might. It might not. Housing is incredibly community driven. If you're in the wrong community at the wrong time, you're in a world of hurt, man. How do you know if you're the right community? Well, I'll just give you mine in Bernie, Texas. Lived in the Cibolo Creek subdivision, and we got in there the first, the first go around. There's like 10,000 houses in there now. They had to fix the roads because of traffic and going through Bernie is so, so insane. Those houses are costing roughly the same as what we sold it for. And, uh, in 2011 roughly I, so the moral of the story is it could work for you south texas is booming you would think that my house that we lived in would be booming too not necessarily because people say whoa while well, there's a school in the neighborhood the freaking traffic's insane to get through here Traffic to get to San Antonio was insane to get on uh, I-10 West, or I-10 East, I should say. 
When I was there, it wasn't like that. Be careful with debt, man. It makes your eyes big. It can put a hurting on your finances. At the end of the day, you still owe. At the end of the day, the bank can call that loan anytime they want. And when they do, what are you gonna do? Now, obviously they can't just say, hey Josh, you owe us you know, $300,000 on this mortgage. But what are you gonna do when that happens? Not on the mortgage, but on a credit card, a car loan, on a, uh, a jumbo loan with a, was a 10 year jumbo where you pay it all after 10 years or you can refinance. The funny thing about that, or you can refinance, what if you can't get terms because you have no job? That's what called a balloon payment. Well, when it balloons, you got no income. Anyway, be careful with debt, my friend. Sorry about the, uh, the out of breath there. feels good. I'm not working out anymore because my shoulder. So I'm going for these long walks now. Sweating like a pig. My man feels good. It's even hard kind of hurting. I'm just holding that phone up like this in my right hand. And getting that surgery done on uh, June 12th. Six weeks in a, uh, a splint after, no, a splint, a sling after that. Six weeks of uh, PT after that. And I think six weeks of low, low recreational activities in terms of working out. When you've been working out your whole life, at least as a, as a young man till today, I'm 48 going on 49, not being able to work out is, uh, you do lose something. Almost be like a guitarist losing his left hand or not having a feeling in his left hand. I mean, you're playing guitar your whole life. All of a sudden, you can't, you can't do any chords. Watch that debt. All right, we'll see you.